Friends, this is probably one of the most important episodes I have recorded thus far, and that is in no way disrespectful to anyone who's formerly been on this podcast, but I want to tell you, I am really glad you are here with us today. This is Listen For Real, and we are doing just that. I'm Jennifer Brown, and I am with Jessica Michaels today. Now, we have a bit of a trigger warning. We are talking about some really important stuff, okay? And we're discussing sexual assault. So if this is not something you're in a time or place where you can be or want to be hearing about this, it is absolutely perfect and appropriate for you to opt out today. And if you are sticking around, we just ask that you join us in the conversation. Would you just envision that you are right here on a couch with two friends? Because that is how I see this, Jess. I'm so glad you're here. We are here as if I'm patting the couch next to me going, hey, come sit down. <laughs> we both have our hot cup of tea. Have our hot tea. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm really, really happy we are talking because let me say something. I believe wholeheartedly y'all in the power of our stories, the power of your stories. And I've said this before in talks I've given that stories have the power to set people free and call people to account. And Jess is one of these many brave humans who is creating huge change especially around the area of sexual assault. She is a concept that is not to be underestimated. There are movements that we have seen. The Me Too movement is one. I truly, with every ounce of my being and my marrow, believe that this movement that Jessica is a part of creating on behalf of and with in concert with other people is insanely powerful and it is going to change the landscape. It's going to change the landscape about how we talk about sexual assault, how we normalize um, dialogue and, and support in something that's been hidden. It, it, it is, it is everything. And so that's why I, I am, a little bit out of flow because I know how much this matters to you, Jess, in your story that you're going to share with us, but also how this will matter forever for so many people. And so would you just share a little bit about your story and why you are here and talking now about this? Because I know this is not a Venice story this, this for many decades was not a story you told and you probably never imagined, right? That this was going to be a direction you were going to go with your life. I mean, you could have never, never, so never. Will, you just tell, will you tell a little bit about who you are and, and how we got here? Yes. Thank you so much, Jen, for having me on. And thank you so much for believing in, in this message that I am um, focusing my life mission on. Uh, I was a professional dancer for 10 years in New York City. Uh, And 1991, when I was 22 years old, I was raped by Jeffrey Epstein. And my, the way my brain and body responded, I shut it down. I just shut it down, shut it out. And then I walked around for 30 years, believing I was stupid, that it was all my fault that I was stupid. What kind of a person let something like that happen to them? And I told a very small number of people, uh, but I never told a therapist. I never got help. I never addressed it. After Jeffrey Epstein was arrested in 2019, and I saw his face go across my... (laughs) my cell phone, uh, and went into a panic attack. Um, I knew that if I was going to share my story ever at all, ever, 
it was going to be because I wanted to bring a solution, a solution or a different way of looking at the problem. I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur. I was a professional dancer. I was a co-owner of a performing arts academy. I created my own stage makeup line. I was a program director for a nonprofit. I um, So my my soul is around problem solving and being a serial entrepreneur. And so I knew I was not going to even talk about this until I, I had come up with a solution or was in some way going to use my story to make a difference. Mm-hmm. I wasn't just going to tell my story. I just wasn't, I wasn't going to be just another sexual assault survivor. I just mm-hmm. felt like that was not, not what I needed to do. And there's nothing wrong with people that share their stories in that way, because that awareness is so important. Yeah. Um, but I was not capable of doing it that way. Um, but there was a big problem. I didn't realize that I had such a traumatic response to even speaking the words about it. And so that was 2019. I could not verbalize what had happened without having severe traumatic response. Uh, And that included headaches, that included being overwhelmed with exhaustion, um, having to sleep, uh, becoming really brain foggy and unable to think straight, make decisions, say coherent sentences. Yeah. <laughs> I had to work really hard over the last couple of years to just heal those parts of myself, face that story, be able to share it among people um, without falling into severe trauma response. Um, so that has been the work I've been doing. So in that work, I've learned so much about trauma that I think we don't know and understand. Uh, that a lot of stuff that's more current now and I've come up with a solution. So I thought, okay, now I'm ready. It's 30 years later. I never want another person to wait 30 years to heal. So can I ask you a question right off the bat? Yes. As you were just talking about that, I am so thankful you just illustrated how difficult this is to articulate and talk about and even come up with in your own mind. And here's why. I remember, remember when Christine Blasey Ford came out um, Mm -hmm. with her story um, when Kavanaugh was being um, put forth as Supreme Court justice. And she is one of many who have had to go public with something that is hard to even process privately. Yes. But I was definitely, and I just have to own this and it actually grieves me that I'm saying this, but you know what, if I say it, there's going to be other people that hear themselves in my voice. We judge that person who comes forward when they are inarticulate and, and kind of like scattered and can't remember or are foggy with the, the, the particulars. So we go ahead and we, and I did this with her. I did. Yeah. A lot of people. I, I thought this has got to be, I'm, I remember saying this, she, I believe her that she was assaulted. It just may not have been him. She's just confusing situations and people because she's got no clarity and there's no one that can corroborate. I mean, I'm just so embarrassed to say that now, knowing the things I know now. But how many other people heard the same sound bites I did and made that same generalization? And that makes me so sad. So we can't sit in that. What we can do is learn and do better, right? That's yes. part of your message. So first of all, thank you in the beginning for just, because that calls me out and um, gives me shivers to go, oh, please, I don't want to miss these things. And and, and there's got to be someone else, I guarantee right now, listening to us, who's here in this conversation and going, oh my God, I've done that. I've done that. I thought she doesn't even have her facts straight. How valid is this story? Yeah. Will you speak to that a little more? Because if I recall knowing you, and we've talked about this, that's part of in the beginning too, that plays out to why you never reported in the beginning. Yes. Like who's going to believe me yes. when it was fresh in your mind? When it was fresh in my mind, yes. But what, um, so what we know about trauma right now, and this is more recent, I would say five to 10 years of research. What we know now is that it's not just the traumatic event that causes the trauma. It's how we internalize it. So I had a moment where 
my friend was willing to go with me to the police station. And in my head, I said, nope, I'm a 22 year old dancer and I'm telling on a wealthy Wall Street guy that owns a plane. Who's going to believe me? And I shut it down internally. I blamed myself because I froze. I froze. So I thought, why, why didn't I run? Why, why, why didn't I scream? Why didn't I kick him off? What, why, why did I do that? Oh, I must be stupid. It must be my fault. Not understanding that that is actually a very typical traumatic response. Freeze is completely normal. And it's as automatic as if, if you took your hand and you put it on a stove, a hot stove, you don't think about it and go, oh, my hand is burning right now. I think I will remove my hand. No, that's not what happens. The hand reacts, the body responds before you can even think about it. In a traumatic experience like a rape, your body responds without thinking about it. In fact, it shuts down that whole thinking part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, shuts it down. So you can think. So not only does it shut it down when that happens to you afterwards, when you're processing or trying to even process it, if you can even remember pieces of it, because what the brain does is that actually protects you. It protects you from what you can't process. process. And and so it will take that memory and not only will it, it, it jumbles up the wiring, the neural pathways get all jumbled up. So, so when things happened, where they happened, uh, kind of get all jumbled up. That's one thing, but also it actually affects an area of the brain called the Brachus region. And the Brachus area is the area of speech. So not only is it, is it really difficult for me to say it to you? I can't even say it in my head. So it's not that I, I, it's not, oh, it's just so emotionally painful. I can't say it. The literally the, the, the same area of the brain that is affected by a stroke Mm. is affected during trauma. So recall, recall and articulating even to give facts, dates, times, memories, people exactly would be jumbled. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's the Uh, brain's way. And then we condemn, we condemn someone. Yeah. So I will tell you, I am a survivor of also childhood sexual abuse. Mm. I have limited memories. It happened between four and six years old. I have some memories and some things that happened that let me know what happened. I also told my mom, my mom told me later on in life. So I know what happened, Um, but I cannot access those memories. And the brain will only release those memories as I now understand it from my trauma therapist. The brain only releases those memories when it is sure that that human organism is very resourced and safe enough to, to experience them. So a lot of times, even when you see court cases, like just because she, Christine, Christine, Blasey Ford, Blasey Ford, just because she said it and she was able to do it doesn't mean that she was necessarily felt safe enough to do it. She probably went into this horrific traumatic response afterwards. It's the same thing that happened in the Glenn Maxwell trial. Those, those girls that were expected to come forward and to uh, sit on the stand and give testimony accusing Ghislaine Maxwell, just because they were able to do it as best they could, doesn't mean they were necessarily safe enough to do it and that it was necess- good for them on an emotional level. Um, it's another reason why talk therapy can actually be more harmful because talking about it can almost reinforce those neural pathways rather than the processing of it, which takes a whole on a whole body and needs a whole body processing. One of the things I discuss is that um, I would I would be emotionally overwhelmed and completely numb and disconnected from my body at the same time. That's the way I would describe how I felt afterwards. That there's a disconnect from the body. Okay, so so you responded in freeze. There's fight. There's flight. There's freeze, and there's fawn. Right? Do I understand that? Yes. So would you just explain those for the new to those terms? Because I never knew fawn. Yeah. And I never really knew freeze. I've always been fight or flight. Right? Fight or flight. We thought there oh were my two. Gosh. We all thought there were two. Okay. Yeah. So I know you have studied this and researched this. Y'all, first of all, we're not making this stuff up. There is science, <laughs> there is data. Um, 
because there's so much amazing trauma research now, it is not um, perhaps what, depending on the generation you're in, what you once thought, uh, whether it's, I've had guests on here with regard to PTSD, different things. It is not all of the things we once thought. And there is so much research. And what is so encouraging is there's so much help. So would you explain those and maybe how that played into you and your decision to respond, not respond, et cetera? So there's no choosing fight, flight, freeze, or fawn for one thing, just so that, you know, it's something that happens automatically. It's in the primitive part of the brain. It's a survival mechanism that it's, it's like a survival switch that gets flipped. Yep. Um, fight. Obviously fight is that when we have that will and that energy to, to scream, mm -hmm. to say, we have the fight, even in our voice, mm -hmm. in our willfulness to say no, then there is flight. Now flight doesn't always mean to run away. Flight can also mean that your ability to think just disappears, just completely that, like, disassociation. So yeah, your so body is there and this thing is happening to your body, but your mind just, leaves. Ooh, you're just, you, you completely dissociate, um, mm -hmm. on all of these, by the way, your prefrontal cortex can disengage. It's literally adrenaline that is fueling that fight. You don't know what you, you don't, you're not necessarily suddenly choosing ninja moves that you happen to see on TV. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not ninja ninjing your way out of this situation. Your, your, your brain is shut down and you are fighting and it is pure primitive brain primal brain. Um, freeze. So this is the other thing I didn't understand about freeze is it's not only that your body freezes, your voice freezes. And, and at, at, there was a point where, when I was being assaulted, where I just, everything looked really gray. And in my head, I was like, I don't want this right now, but I can't make him stop. And I didn't know why. And that's why I blamed myself, but I stopped even being able to feel anything. Like it was numb. My body was numb. I wasn't floating outside my body. Like some people say they have that happened. They're floating outside, but that's not what happened to me. My body just stopped being able to move. And then the dissociate. So you can also, just so that, you know, you can have multiple things that happen. So after it was done, you know, these trauma responses are not like one and done. And that's how you're, it's, it crosses over each other. So at one point, I don't remember, you know, putting my dress back on. I don't remember, uh, I don't remember how I got to the subway. I know I got on the subway going the wrong way. And I remember standing on the subway platter platform and going, what just happened? Like I couldn't quite find the memory. What just happened? It just, you think that people leave that situation and they go, oh my God, I can't believe it happened. No, the, the, there is this cloudy, foggy, like, wait, did that, what, what, what was that? What happened? That's that's all part of that dissociative freeze response. Uh, it's it's like a with, form of shock. It sounds like, like yes, you know, it's when a physiological. Are yes, yeah. if you were, you can describe it in physiological physiological characteristics. Your heart rate, your your blood flow, your sensations in your body. It has a. It's a physiological response to trauma. That's what people don't understand about sexual assault and trauma is they think that it is some you know, mental and emotional response. It's like this ethereal thing outside the body. No, it is literally a brain and nervous system injury. And your nervous system is attached to everything in your body. And so that's why within two weeks, I broke out in the cystic like acne all over my face within, within, um, three weeks, I was so hypervigilant and, and anxious. I had to move out of New York city within six months. I had lost so much weight. I, I could pull a size zero jeans off down off my hips without unbuttoning them. I had a very physiological response to this and I told no one what was going on. Okay. That leads me. I want to talk about Joanne for a minute. Cause I think this is really, um, so do you think that all of that physical response may have been mitigated or avoided because you were able to talk about it 
and share it and have people rally to your support, could that have been avoided? And I, I, I've, I'm being so careful on how I word this because mm-hmm. I don't want to sound like I'm minimizing anything right, right. because no, it's that's... all a legit response to a horrific situation. Right. Yeah. But I'm thinking about your body, like literally how we react physiologically and your body was flipping out. Yes. Losing weight, cystic acne, all of these things, because it's like screaming, this happened to me, this happened to me. You know, and my brain me. was shutting it down. And right. my brain was like shutting it down and, you know, not so my body was responding. My body was kind of stuck. The way they, the way they explained it, it was stuck in that fight or flight because I, I was not processing what happened. So your body gets stuck in a fight or flight response, that trauma response. And so you become hyper vigilant. You, you, you suddenly become, you know, you freeze mm-hmm. under very, you know, simple circumstances. You, you get scared, you fight under very like normal, like you have abnormal reactions. I actually heard a wonderful quote that says trauma, trauma comes up as a reaction, not as a memory. It's Bessel van der Kolk from the body keeps the score. Trauma comes up as a reaction. And it's, it's exactly, exactly. I, I, you know, you re it's how we respond, we physically respond it's not like there's all these memories just floating around and I have these, you know, these things happening. That's not how right. it came up. Y'all, this is so important because that's why this is, we, we must, we must respond to ourselves and other people with compassion and grace and deep listening versus thinking, because my response is different than your response. We're wired differently. We're different people. And here's what's so crazy about what you just said is in the moment with Epstein, you froze. But in other situations, you might fight. Might it isn't always Depending the on, same. It's like, not the same. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, not. It's like never you, reliable or the same. It's never right. reliable. <laughs> and the reality is, based on what I've learned from my trauma therapist, is probably the reason I froze with Epstein and had such an extreme response afterwards is because I was sexually abused as a child. Mm. So I turned into a five-year-old, yeah. which goes up into that feign response, right? A five-year-old doesn't really fight when they're being, you know, assaulted. No. So, so that's that, there's that little bit of a, um, well, I'm going to comply now. Cause that's going to save my life. Not as a thought process, but that primitive brain trying to preserve the life of that human organism in any way that it can, in any way that it can. Oh, yeah. So you, you said you wanted to talk about Joanne because I yeah, think that, you're, because yeah. that was so important because you did have one person. So tell that's super instructive and had a huge impact me. So you talk about Joanne and how she came in and left the story and is now back. <laughs> yeah. So, so first I want to go back one little bit. Um, one of the reasons I know so much about trauma now, and one of the reasons I've been able to heal as much as I have been able to heal is because I have a phenomenal trauma therapist because I'm also from Newtown, Connecticut, where the Sandy Hook shooting happened. So I, I started having a reaction after Sandy Hook because my body became triggered, not understanding why I was having this inordinate physical response to Sandy Hook. I wasn't in the school. We did lose three little girls at the dance studio that I taught at, but I wasn't in the school and I didn't understand why I was having this inordinate reaction. The therapists that we had come into Newtown were amazing and they were learning. So it's 2012. And uh, the way she expressed it to me, she said, Jessica, we were literally pulling in every resource, every expert on trauma for these six-year-olds and families that we could. So she had all of this. She's, she has all of these techniques that she learned in her back pocket, like on the go. She had, sometimes we were like, we were in sessions with people and then learning and then in sessions and learning. They were constantly, constantly growing their knowledge bank, improving their skills. And so by the time I met her in 2018, you know, she'd already had six years of working with all of these Sandy Hook families. And so I had the benefit of working with this person who who, who just knew, so gave me what's called, it's called a psychoeducation. I got the best psychoeducation possible. In fact, I'm now in, 
in a program to become a trauma recovery coach, a certified trauma recovery coach to improve my knowledge about what I'm talking about. And she said, yeah, what we've learned is that early intervention is key. There, there was no shame in Sandy Hook. Um, the community came together. They were, um, they were taken care of within our small community. They were, um, they were cushioned. The kids were taken care of. Um, all of us got a tremendous psychoeducation during that experience. And I not only experienced trauma on the outside, got to see it. I mean, on the inside, got to see it from the outside. Yeah. Um, so when I started thinking about how I wanted to respond to my own sexual assault experience, I started thinking about like after Sandy Hook, we have active shooter drills in every single school in the country. After 9-11, we have security in every single airport in the whole world. Mm -hmm. And even something as simple as if there is smoke, if something's burning, we all know what to do. We've all been taught it as a child. Stop, we know roll. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Don't breathe that smoking, get low because it's going to hang up, up high. Mm -hmm. And, and, and those are important things to learn. And there's a lot of resources, and a lot of money going towards those disasters to prevent harm and loss of life. Right. But the reality is, as I started to look at it, is that we are more likely to have been or will be sexually assaulted as women and girls than we are ever to be in a school with an active shooter on a plane with a terrorist or even in a burning building. Wow. In fact, the latest Justice Department stats are that a, an American is sexually assaulted every 68 seconds. Nine out of 10 of them will be women. And somewhere between 91 and 99% of the attackers will be male. So when I started thinking about the problem, I started remembering the day after I was assaulted. The day after I was assaulted, I went into work. And my friend Joanne was there and she's like, hey, how you doing? How'd your interview go yesterday? And, and I wasn't responding to her. And she asked me what was wrong three times. And when I still didn't respond, she grabbed me by the hand, pulled me into the office and I dissolved into tears. And I told her, John, I told her a fraction of what happened. I, I was too humiliated to even tell her the whole thing. I told her a fraction of what happened. And before I could even finish what I was saying, she grabbed me and she said, Jessica, we need to go to the police. And she was clear thinking. She was in her right mind. And I, in my very fragile and very vulnerable and traumatized in shock state, said to myself, who is going to believe me over this wealthy Wall Street guy with blame? And so not only did I shut that down within me, but I was so humiliated. I proceeded to not ever talk to my loyal and kind friend again for 30 years. That's the, that's the degree of humiliation you feel, even if you do share it with someone. Oh, and she did everything right. She, she did everything right. She believed right. you. She believed without me without question. She thought, without question. She and she was brave enough in 1991 to say to oh. me, let's go to the police. Yeah. Which we which you and I know we you, people didn't even do that. Like that's right. that was a big deal. You know, she and she knew um enough to say, nope, come on, come with me. I'm gonna I'm gonna take you to the police station. And I was like, nope. And I just shut shut it all down because I was not capable of making good decisions in that moment. And that was the moment that I realized, what if I had done something different? What if I was, I looked at Sandy Hook and everybody rushed in. There was no shame. There was support right away. Um, and that got me thinking that like, well, how lucky I was to have a friend like Joanne. And, and I thought we have all these other disaster preparedness responses and all of these other tragedies. And yet the prevalence of sexual assault, we have nothing. It's just a, an emergency moment. And we have to think on the fly in that moment after it's happened. So I thought, what if, okay, can I share the idea now? Yeah. 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 Want, yeah. Oh. I was just going to say, let's go to break. And then I want you to share it. Share it now. All right. <laughs> then we we'll can go to break. A, let's, let's take a break. Let's take a break. And then we'll come back. <laughs> okay. okay. We'll keep you on the edge of your seat, everybody. We're going to like grab your coffee. Oh, it's so, it's so 
genius and important and brilliant. Y'all stay, stay with us. We're going to take a quick break and then you need to hear this because this is game changing. This is going to change everything. We'll be right back. Okay, y'all, listen to me. We have to talk about the three Joannes, but we have to be fully transparent for a minute. We decided, Jessica and I tried to record this before. This is actually a second round at recording this. And she was just saying on the break, oh my gosh, this is so much better than the last one when I was flighty. Was, was that the word you said? Flighty, flighty. And yeah. I thought she said sweaty. And she goes, yeah, I was probably sweaty probably too. Probably sweaty too. Because <laughs> there's just so much at stake here because A, a it, is, it is, like you said, talking about it has its own whole host of things you're grappling with. But then I know you and that you want your message to bring help and value. And there's so much writing on that. And I know how seriously you take that. But explain, you had a lot of dynamics going on in December when we first attempted to record this, the trial. Talk more about that because I, I really, I appreciate this audience. You all are knowing that we're just really real and transparent here. And this is just this stuff is uh, hard and not easy. And I want to give everyone listening permission and invitation to just have hard, not easy, sweaty and flighty conversations. <laughs> yes. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> that don't necessarily have to be recorded before a national audience. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, in December uh, of 2021, that's when the Ghislaine Maxwell trial was going on. And, uh, Explain was, for those who don't realize Ghislaine Maxwell, just really quick. I think everyone in the world knows Jeffrey yeah. Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, but in case they don't, can you explain Ghislaine, that really fast in a nutshell? Ghislaine Maxwell was the socialite woman who worked for Epstein pro procuring these young girls and was tried and found guilty in court, but in December was when she was on trial. So, so what you have to understand is like for all of us that were Epstein survivors, mm -hmm. in fact, more so than I even realized, I was hooked on every single social media post, looking for it in um, the news, uh, looking for every bite of information. And when the verdict came out that she was guilty, it felt like the first time really being heard around this topic. And so I, I didn't even realize how emotionally I was invested in it. Um, but it's also December 14th is the Memorial Day of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. So December was very heavy for me and and it affects every part. I have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. It, it, it affects my energy levels, it affects my ability to think sometimes if I'm overwhelmed, if I haven't paced myself, or if there are just anniversaries or events all happening at the same time around this, you know, traumatic topics. Think, think uh, the anniversary of maybe a mom or dad's death and how, how activating that can be. And then, and then imagine that being played out on the world stage uh, for a you know, whole month. <laughs> that's, that's how it felt. And uh, yeah. And, and what we were saying when we went on break was how trauma it, it's all hormones, Jen. I mean, imagine you're talking about the adrenal glands that pump out the adrenaline that then with the adrenaline is the go button, the cortisol is the break button. And those two hormones just coursing through your body and through your brain 
on, uh, you know, on automatic pilots uh, for decades and how that negatively impacts everything in your body. And, and that's why we're, I want to go back to the three Joannes and this whole new movement you're creating around this. Yes. Because some of that can be mitigated. Yes, I believe. We can do early invention and respond intervention and respond. A lot of different somatic therapies, not just talk therapy. My, my trauma therapist is actually an art and music therapist. The somatic so, meaning the body. The body. Versus the whole just body talking and, through something. Yeah, we, we're yeah. all so unique. We're fearfully and wonderfully and uniquely made. All of us are so different. You all remember I had the um, Stacey Rowan on human design talking about how uniquely we are created and designed on a previous episode last month. And if you all recall, we're all so unique in the way we respond, in the way we make decisions. So to think and judge according to, well, I wouldn't have responded that way, or my so-and-so didn't respond that way, that's insanity, right? So let's talk now about this idea that you have and this movement you're creating with regard to the three Joannes. Okay. Awesome. So if we know that part of what causes the deepest long-term effects of trauma are how we internalize it, how we internalize the event. And if we know that early intervention could potentially mitigate how we internalize that event. I started to come up with this idea, like my friend, Joanne, she was amazing, you know, saw something was wrong and asked me, um, believed me when I told her very little information, was brave enough and courageous enough to not only suggest we go to the police station, but offer to go with me. So I thought, why can't we have some kind of a plan in place? We all need a Joanne, but what if we actually had three Joannes? What if we had and normalized? That's the big thing. What if we normalized having a prepared response to sexual assault? So for example, I decide you're going to be, I choose three people that I trust, that I know are gonna have my back, that I know trust me. And I say, okay, you guys are, you guys are my three Joannes. Jen, will you be one of my Joannes? Okay, that means we agree that we're gonna have to have some difficult conversations right now before something happens around, you know, if I were to be raped, okay? Because the reality is, Jen, if I told you I was raped last night, would you know what to do? then, uh, okay, we should call the police. No, I, I wouldn't. And if I told you I didn't want to go to the police, would you really know? Nobody mm-hmm. really knows what to do That's right. in That's that right. moment. And including the person that has been raped. And so, and you're not in the best position to make decisions. So basically our agreement is like, Jen, I know now that I am not going to be in the best position to make decisions if I were sexually assaulted. So I'm calling on you and my other two Joannes to help me make decisions and to be my team, my care team when something happens. So before that happens, we have to talk about a plan. We have to look at, you know, do we go to the hospital first or we do, do we go to the police station first? Do we call one of the local organizations or do we call that national hotline? I don't know which, you don't know which, And the reality is at least right now, we can talk about it. We can call up those phone numbers now if we want and find out of that information rather than leaving me to try to figure all that out after the fact, after I'm in a traumatic state. You know, who's going to bring Oh, Did you have a question before I go on? No, but I I just got to say, okay, this is so important because which may or may not happen. So what we know is right there, if you stopped right there and you just went to your three Joannes and go, the unthinkable has happened. Right there already, you are going to be better off 
than what typically happens, which is you go inward, you never talk about it again as you did, and you carry the shame and then you deal with it in your body and you are, you experience all manner of shit storm. Okay. Can I just say that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what people need to know and that I didn't realize, and I really want to underscore this before you keep going, is y'all, it isn't so much the rape itself, even though that's horrific and awful. The real trauma, and I want to say this carefully and just correct me if I'm not saying this correctly. The real trauma is the shame and the silence that that assault um that, that keeping that assault silent and covered up and not told, that's what compounds the trauma and, and the pain and the illness and the, the trauma itself. I, I, I'm totally struggling, but to ar- articulate that. So it's not the actual oftentimes no. assault itself. It's the silence and shame of it afterwards. Right? It, it, Am I getting it, that right? It, it's both. Okay. Um, it is the, it's the event mm-hmm. and how we perceive it, how Thank heavy you. that event and what that event means, what meaning we put on that event. That's it. That's it. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that because when we can share it, the understood, heard, seen, known, validated that's different than when, and then we, we realize, okay, I'm not, I'm not bad. I'm not a fool. I'm not stupid that I get it now. So by having three important people and then getting the help you need, that's going to change everything versus trying to navigate that. If you even navigate it on your own. Right. Right. Okay. I get it. So, and, and this is, this is what I think, like, besides then going on and, uh, you know, if, if, if I have to go to the hospital, somebody has got to bring my clothes Yeah, because I didn't know this, that when you go to get a forensic rape kit done, um, you know, after they've been poking and prodding every orifice of your body and taking pictures, they take your clothes, which they need to do for Mm -hmm. DNA evidence, but then you don't have any clothes. So even just having someone to bring clothes for you to be there with you because the other thing. So I will tell you two situations. I had a friend that was recently raped and she said, Jessica, I don't want to tell another stranger what happened. And then I, I'm now also working with um, a, a new friend who is a rape crisis advocate in hospitals. And she said, 80% of rape victims come in with no one. And she goes, yeah, I'm there, but it's not the same. It's not the same as having someone that you know and trust sitting there, holding your hand, hugging you, talking to you while you are going through this, just even the rape kits, not having to do that alone. So what I've heard a lot from survivors is it's not just the event, but it's then going through that, that rape kit talking to police officers who are not trauma-informed. It's the compounding experience of, of shame that then points back, well, all they're doing is mirroring back how shameful I should feel. And that that is part of the impact. So what I'm saying is we plan. We say, Jen, you're going to bring my clothes. You're going to be the one to go to the hospital with me. Kate, my friend over here, she's, she's, her dad is a police officer. So if something happens, Kate, your dad's the only one I want to talk to. I don't want to talk to anybody else. If something happens to me, can we please get your dad? Then I've got, um, you know, Julie over here. She's going to be the one that if I say it's okay, she's going to be the one that reaches out to my family because I don't even want to have to tell my family. I don't want to have to tell anybody what happened, but this is the key. This is the really key part. So I actually don't want to have to say any words at all. It's really hard to say any words after it happened. So part of the pact, Jen, you're one of my, you're one of my Joannes. Mm -hmm. We're going to decide on a secret word or a secret emoji. So let's say it's, you know, pineapple or Malamars or sunflower, but, or we say we red balloon, red balloon. Okay. Reason I liked red balloon is because red kind of red flag, but at the same time I had someone explain it to me and they said, uh, he had sent me some red balloons and I said, what does that mean to you? And he said, oh, it means positive, buoyant 
wishes. And so I really liked that concept. It's like a dual meaning. It's a red flag thread, Mm -hmm. but it's positive point wishes. So, Mm -hmm. so let's say it's a red balloon. Uh, I promise you, Jen, because I trust you and I know you trust me. I promise you that within 24 hours of something happening, I am going to send you a red balloon and you are going to promise to me that because you trust me, because you know me, because you believe in me, that no matter what you are going to hear me, see me, believe me, trust me, be there for me. And our plan goes into action. And you are not going to ask for any details. You are not going to need to know any more details. Once you get that red balloon, you're going to know this is a, a, a sexual assault happened, regardless of what I believe, whether I believe it's my fault or not. I also want to clarify that because there, there are a lot of times where we still are on the fence of whether we believe it's our fault. Still, I'm going to press that button because I don't know. And I'm not going to try to decide when I'm in a traumatized state. So you're going to get, our, a good yeah, mm-hmm. not our best decision-making state, right? Not, not our best decision-making mm-hmm. moments. I need, I need people. I trust. Um, I promise that I will send that to you. You promise you won't ask me any questions because I'm not going to be able to answer them. However, my caveat to that is what if I am surrounded by this bubble of safety? What if I am just coddled and protected and loved and hugged and supported and said, I believe you. You don't even have to tell me what happened. I trust you. And I am here for you. And, and, what do you want me to do besides what we've already planned? I've got that. But what do you need right now? Do you need chocolate? Do you need pizza? Do you need a glass of wine? What do you need right now? Because I'm here. Right. And I believe that in that moment of feeling safe and secure, our nervous system can ask, de-escalate. And then rather than getting stuck in that trauma response like I did, that there is this great potential for, okay, we are safe now. I can talk about what happened, which means I'm not going to try to interpret what happened myself. I'm going to get feedback right away that I am seen and I am heard. So we are going to thwart and completely circumvent that shame, secrecy, and isolation with safety and comfort and security and community. Com- uh, this little mini community. And I believe that if we start then just normalizing an emergency response to this global tragedy, mm-hmm. that then not only have I set myself up as like, hey, you know what? I have my three Joannes. I've set myself up for protection from, from deep long-term trauma, but I've also set myself up now because within 24 hours, there are now three people that will know something happened. So it will take away the one thing that predators thrive on, which is secrecy. That once we choose three Joannes, this will never be a secret ever again in the history of time, ever. I'm losing my mind right now because this (laughs) this is so important. Okay, will you stay for a second episode? This is I would so love to stay for a second episode. That okay. would be an okay. honor. We're going to do that because, but I want to, I want to talk about a few things and then we're going to, we're going to, we're going to record a second episode. This is just okay. too important. Here's what I know I was thinking. And I wonder if other people are thinking this right now as they're listening. It is easy to bristle, to go, wait a minute, having three Joannes and all this proactive stuff feels like an expectation or um, I, I'm like inviting the worst. It's kind of like when people, cause this is human nature, right? We do this. It's when people go, well, I don't want to buy life insurance or I don't want to do this. Cause then that means it could happen. Y'all I'm going to be very frank in the time you've been listening to this podcast, 10 more people approximately have been assaulted in the United States. Yes. That's not even the world. Yep. That's the United States. 10 people right now, lives have been altered. Okay. So the, 
this let's not get caught in that framework that's if I do this, ooh, that's just too close, that's too uncomfortable. I'd rather bury my head and just try to be safe and and hope that this doesn't happen to me, my daughter, my sister, my mom, right? Yeah. But here's what's crazy, Jess. Okay. And I want to talk more about in our next episode, please, please. I think in actuality, this will decrease incidences. I think so too, because I, I think that once you talk about a plan, uh, so I have triple a, I have triple a because I don't know how to change a tire. Right. And I'm not worried now of driving on a highway late at night because I have triple a, I know that if my tire goes, you know, blows or my battery has a problem, I can call triple a it's kind of the same thing. It's just knowing that I have solid educated support when I need it. Cause I don't know how to change a tire and no one is coming to fix this for us. There, there are, there are movements to, you know, have a trauma informed justice system. And there are movements around, you know, getting the statute of limitations Mm -hmm. removed, which should happen. And I will be part of that movement as well. We need to talk about that. Yeah. We can't wait for men to change, um, calling out their friends that are, uh, being misogynist and sexist and, um, you know, disrespectful objectification of women talk, that locker room talk uh, should never be acceptable. We can't wait for people to change their behaviors. So since this is so prevalent, we need to, we need to start coming together because the, the thing is, is that I pushed Joanne away, somebody that was this wonderful and amazing human being, when the reality is we have a choice to now bring each other together and deal with it together as a community. That's right. And not wait for somebody else to fix it for us, yeah. but to actually be proactive and say, you know what? I'm I'm going to just make sure that I have support in an emergency situation. No different than if I have a list of emergency numbers that I give my doctor. That's right. That's right. Okay. So when we come back together, I want to talk about all that. I want to talk about the talk about men's role Mm -hmm. and how they can be allies for us. Yes. In this, this is a human problem. This is is. not male bashing where men are the problem. Women are the problem. Women are victims. Men are that. No, 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 no. Y'all let's not get caught up in that, please. This is too important to, to move forward. Okay. And we can move forward together as human beings, but also, um, I really want to reinforce what you just said, the power of being able to go to, let's say your three Joannes to knowing you have a plan in place. I just psychologically went, A, I believe it will decrease, like you said, if every man in America, let's say if he's 91% of the men, or the predators are the are predators. Men, yes. Okay? yes. If they know within 24 hours, to your point, three other people are going to know about this and it won't be in silence and shame. Maybe they're going to think twice. Okay. So I do believe that could decrease incidences. I can't help but wonder if psychologically as women who put this plan into place, who are more informed, who know and have just done the footwork and have normalized the conversation around this may have a whole different demeanor that doesn't bring victimization in the first place. And I don't want to say that wrong to say that someone's more easily picked. I want to be careful there. Tell me what well, you're just going well, to say. That, well, so say that yeah, vict, vict, victimization is a is one of those sticky words, right? Everyone yes. wants to think that you know, oh, they're just playing a victim role. Nobody, right. nobody wants to play a victim role. Nobody would choose that. It's a, it's usually a trauma response. How important is we talk about that? This equipping of women empowers us, and I believe may decrease yes. the chance of something happening. And again, this is my opinion only. And um, it just, we're better 
it's like an insurance better, policy. I don't know. I, I mean, I can't find the words. Yeah. 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 I, I, I hear what you're saying. And that's exactly what I'm thinking too. Like if we're actually having these conversations, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable yeah. to have these conversations. It's uncomfortable for me to say to you, we are more likely to have been, or will be sexually assaulted than any of the things that we spend billions of dollars on to, to prevent, you know, right. harm. Right. Um, it's uncomfortable to talk about it, especially in regards to children. But, but the truth is, is that everybody is so uncomfortable about it that they're not listening. Look at Boy Scouts, USA Gymnastics, universities, mm -hmm. the, the police. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard of people going to the police and they've been um, victims of assault have been just shrugged off. I believe that if we, as women, given that nine out of 10 of the, um, victims that have been assaulted are women, that if we start talking about this and just saying, you know what, I'm not going to put my head in the sand anymore. And I am going to talk about it. There is that potential that that primitive brain will not click in that maybe we will get better at, maybe we start having dialogues about practicing how to say no, or what are the different situations that I could be in that would, uh, cause, cause me to freeze. And how do I not like talking actually just giving our brains the, the practice time of just discussing, okay, well, if I'm in this situation and I'm on a date and I really don't want to have sex, you know, practice with me so that I can practice saying no, anything, anything is better than putting our heads in the sand. Anything totally is going to give us a much better chance of not, not falling into a trauma response. Anything is better than what we're doing right now. You're right. Thank you, my friend. Okay. We are, we're going to talk more about this on the next episode, but until then, uh, friend. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for this. Thank you for trusting me with this conversation, uh, trusting this audience. Y'all, this is just super important. Connect with us on Instagram. If you want, don't, don't feel that you're hearing this and you're on the outside. I, the biggest thing I want when you listen to these episodes that we are all here in this conversation together it is not just Jess and I. And so please engage with us on Instagram if you want and chime in and share and um, ask questions. Like, ask questions. Yeah. You know, there are people that are going to be listening that maybe haven't faced that they were sexually assaulted. Because if you'd asked me five years ago, if I had been a sexual assault survivor, I wouldn't have been able to say yes. I didn't, I didn't that term wasn't something I identified with. Right. And so some of you are going to have questions about that. Some of you are going to have questions. Of, ask me all the trauma questions. Call, think, believe you're calling me out on something. Let me, let me share with you what my experience is, what my research and study has shown and what I now know about trauma and how detrimental it is to the mental, emotional, physical, spiritual health of a human life. Thank you all for being here with us. It matters. Keep speaking, keep listening for real, and we'll see you next time. Listen for Real is produced in Rockland, California and is edited and mixed with the help of Mark Edward. Our music, entitled Zero, is written and performed by Shannon Curtis. If you believe conversations like these belong in the world, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And even better, share it with someone else as a real conversation starter. We'll see you next time.